Shazam is uh, it's a very interesting app because it's basically it's just a button. Uh, you push it and it gives you the results. Very easy, easy to understand for the user. Is that how great products need to be? Um, well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, well, you know, if, if Shazam were to prove in the pudding, then I guess it, that's what it is. So, I mean, especially on a mobile device, it's a simple um, user engagement, like, you know, there's only one single thing you can do. It's obviously very helpful in terms of, like, educating people about the product and, and facilitating word of mouth. Um, so as much as that is true, um, I, I think uh, at the same time you kind of need to balance the simplicity of the interface with the kind of strategically big thinking, right? So uh, if, if you think about Shazam, um, it's not just about music recognition. Uh, when we came out first with EID many years ago, uh, we knew that music was a logical entry point, but we also instantly knew that Shazam was more than just that one trick pony. We knew that it was, broadly speaking, a way to engage with your environment, uh, right? understanding what's on TV, learning what's on TV. Um, I, my stereotypical example is always like, look, I wish there was a day that I'm on a hike in the forest and I can use Shazam to understand what birds are chirping around me. And that sounds so silly, but I actually fundamentally still believe in that. So it's kind of like the balance of simplicity and product with thinking big. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that is, uh, it's, it's on my phone, it's an app. Let's um, switch to a different product, uh, TrueCar, which uh, maybe you should quickly explain what TrueCar does, because I'm not sure everyone knows it. Yeah, very quickly. Um, it's a very US-centric company. Uh, when in the United States you buy a car, um, the, the price is not equal for all customers. Uh, if it says the car costs 50,000 euro, then um, Alex may buy a BMW 550xi from the same dealer, uh, uh, the same salesperson uh, just before me, and he may pay 2,000 euro less than me. And maybe he's just a better negotiator than I am. And so how do you solve for that problem? Because in the US, when people buy a car because of the differences in price, they feel that they feel as if they get stitched by the dealer every single time around. And so True Car um, shows what other people really paid for the exact same car in recent history in their uh, uh, geographic area. So we kind of empower the customer with information so that he or she can negotiate correctly. Now there are a lot of platforms um, available that compare prices. How do you differentiate your product when for the user, it does much of what other services do as well? Um, I think, so it's kind of like two pieces to it. So, so first of all, it's kind of like, make sure that you focus on the real consumer pain, right? Um, don't build something that people don't really need. And, and if you ask anybody in the United States, do you, do you distrust your dealer or dealership, then the, the answer is you know, unanimously, yes, you know, help me solve this. So that's one. The second piece is that if you enter a market where there's already an existing product, and I think that's what your question is like, how, how do you how do you kind of like you know uh, take over from them, right? I think about Gmail. You know, Google was for sure not the first one with web-based email, but how did they become so dominant? Is that because their their product in the exact same product category was just five to ten times better than the runner-up? And so that's kind of what we focused on on TrueCar. It's like, okay, there are existing services out there to help you negotiate for a car. But, you know, they weren't based on actual prices. They weren't necessarily geographically targeted. And so we really focused on, like, what will set TrueCar apart from these services, right? And so, I mean, I can go through the nitty-gritty details, but as I said, you know, our pricing was based on real prices, not some kind of, like, magical formula, you know, that nobody understood about. Uh, we just went hyper uh, geographically, so sort of hyper local, uh, and then of course we built a very nice user interface that you know kind of like people understood it just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. Now let's take a couple of steps back. How are great ideas born? For instance, how did you come up with Shazam? That was quite a while ago. Um, smartphones weren't common at that time at all; didn't even exist, I think. Um, how did you come up with the idea of building such a, a smartphone or back then phone app? Yeah, you would think it involves a lot of beer and tequila. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, maybe I'll ask the first part first and then I'll come and show you how Shazam fits in. So, I, I mean, it, I, th I think 
companies or ideas kind of come out of two directions. One of them is people who work in an industry and they see the inefficiencies, the shortcomings, and they and just, they know they can do better. And I just finishing I just finished reading the book Starter Plan by the Zendesk founders, and if you haven't read it, it's a fun book. You should read it. Um, and, and so they had worked in customer service for a long time and felt that their very own products for the companies that they worked for were just stupid and they knew they could do better and outcomes and that's going to be know where that ended, a very good story. Uh, the other category of startups, and now I put Shazam squarely in that box, it's kind of like people, they have ideas but they don't, they're not part of that industry, they actually, they, they don't belong to that industry, they're very naive, they don't understand the norms in the industry and they definitely don't adhere to them because they don't know what they are. Right? And so like, if you look at Shazam, I mean, like, none of us had a background in music or even like single processing to be, to be real, right? So, so we were just so innocent and we thought like, oh, this would be neat and hey, this would you know, solve consumer pain, let's just do it. Uh, anybody who worked in the music space back then, their first reaction was, well, that's impossible, so therefore I'm not going to do it, right? And I think it's a little bit like Airbnb as well, right? It's, when you first hear about it, it's like, okay, that sounds a bit silly because none of these three guys, the, the co-founders of Airbnb, had anything to do with hospitality or any of the hotel industry in general. And, and so, because of their naivety, they've just built a, just built a great service. Uh, I personally have learned that when I learn about a new company and service and it kind of sounds silly or useless, I kind of like, I get on high alert, right? Because that's when I kind of like, okay, pay attention, this might just become something. Well, then now the next step, we've got an idea, uh, seems feasible for the market. How do you develop it into a great product? Um, well, definitely have, make sure you have great engineers. <laughs> um, and and uh, maybe just spending a little bit of time on that. Uh, I've learned the hard way that one, one good engineer will do the work of 10 great, and one great engineer will do the work of 10 good engineers. Um, so, for example, when I kind of took on TrueCar, we had started by um, offshoring development. And, and just, I mean, it was just an absolute disaster. So to the point where I just kind of like cut it off, brought the company to a grinding halt for two, three months and just kind of retooled locally uh, with the best engineers, no matter how much money and time it took to build that team. So, so great engineers is a, is, is, is a, I mean, it's a must have. And then I think Samir talked a little bit about this. It's like you, you want to test your ID, so you definitely want to share it with as many people as possible, including investors. Don't be shy to go to investors even if you don't raise money, right? Uh, and, and socialize it with them and get their reaction. And I think you'll get a quick reading on the market. Um, having said that, um, what shall I say? Um, yeah. Consensus, what other people tell you isn't always right. Uh, there, there has to be an element of kind of like personal belief and conviction as well. Uh, so I'll give you a real example. So uh, 15 years ago when we shot the idea of, Sh of Shazam around, I swear to God, six, seven out of ten people would tell me that it was just stupid. Right? And people would be like, that's silly, who would ever use that? And so nevertheless, we just carried on and did it. Um, Three years ago, I started a company called World Hero, and essentially, you could push a button on your phone to flag somebody who was driving just really badly on the road, right? Uh, because that's a problem. 35,000 people die in US in car accidents. And when I shared that idea with people, everybody was like, it's great, I love it, I use it every day. So I launched it, right? Because the consensus was, this is a great product, and then the reality is nobody used it. And sadly enough, I had to close the company down. So, um, I don't know. Finding the balance between your own beliefs and what others tell you is is is, is not easy. I don't think there's a good, good answer to that. I suppose it's it's also about endurance, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Shazam started uh, uh, 13 years ago, was it? 16. 16 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and only just recently became a well, only uh, became a billion dollar company. So um, how do you, you know, that, that must be really, you know, stressful and you need a lot of uh, you know, mental power just to push through it. How do you do that? Yeah, um, <laughs> um, I mean, look, many of you have your own startups and it's, it, everybody talks about, you know, the highs and the lows and uh, the lows are, can, can, are very real, I think. Um, most companies actually, if you ask them honestly, they will, they will admit that they've had a, what I would call a near-dead experience. I think PayPal actually had multiple near-dead experiences. So did Airbnb, 
and you know unpublished but I'll tell you you know late 2002 we we had our kind of like that moment at Shazam as well where we went around the table and you know with the lawyers there and just everybody had to honestly answer the question shall we carry on for one other month or are we going to close the books and thankfully we carried on so so th those moments are there um, uh, how do you survive them uh, I always say that being a startup CEO or founder, and many people will admit to that, you know, it's one of the loneliest jobs you have, right? Um, you make big decisions multiple times a day, impacting your vision, your belief, the career of all those early employees. And so then you come home and nobody's understanding what you're talking about. So you're just so by yourself. So, so how, how do you deal with that? I'd say, one, never start a company by yourself. Even, uh, I, I will always have a co-founder. Like, to me, it's we're at 50% dilution or multiple co-founders. Somebody you can share you know, everything with through thick and thin. Um, two, I'd say um, make sure that you have great advisors. And I'm not talking about the advisors who are experts in a certain field. Those are definitely valuable. But I'm talking about the emotional advisors, um, people that, you know, you, you know, that have a shoulder for you to cry on. Um, and you kind of want them to be eternal optimists, right? Because you need them to talk you up, not to talk you down uh, when you're in the gutter. Um, and then three, I'd say like, look, because you know you're going to have those lows, celebrate the highs furiously, right? So balance it out. Uh, a true Shazam story in the early days, uh, when we had a good meeting and we came out of that meeting, uh, it was a, a ritual to hit the nearest pub, we were in London, so it was very easy. Hit the nearest pub and, and slam a beer. And, uh, and so if that meeting was at five o'clock in the afternoon, that kind of made sense. If you want to know what, you know, washing down cereal with a beer feels like, I can tell you as well, you know, after an 8 a.m. meeting. <laughs> uh, but so, so yes, th those things um, kind of keep you somewhat even keeled. Mm -hmm. Now let's get a little bit more practical. Uh, if you had to name three, the three most important aspects or elements of a great product, what would those be? Um, addresses a major consumer pain, right? Like, like Shazam. Um, since music was invented, people wondered what the name of the song was. Okay, and there wasn't, there wasn't a solution for it at the time. Two, uh, simple to use. Um, uh, and I'm going to stick to Shazam because it's kind of that makes all sense, right? Just you mentioned it. Push a button. You know, you don't need a, he a hefty tutorial to tell people what it is. Um, I actually like if you think about AdWords. That's another great example. AdWords is a phenomenally complex product. Yet, if you use it for the first time, it kind of talks for itself. But in two minutes, you can set up your own campaign. Mm. That's pretty good. And then the third piece. This is hard. Uh, and if you can do it, I'd say obtain it. It's, it's have some kind of a wow effect in your product. Something that feels magical, something that truly impresses people, something that didn't, they didn't expect, so like a stretch what you think the product can do. Because if, if you can create that, then marketing is no longer needed. It will speak for itself truly word of mouth. Uh, and then so like I see loads of products and they, they solve some problem or that there's something about it and like when I advise companies instantly I'm thinking like what more could you do could you step it up one more thing so that people are just going to be like knocked out of their socks and they will want to talk about your product they will want to show it off to their friends always ask yourself that question could I change it a little bit so it's even more magical now in real life you have to build your product, you have to build up your team, you have to look for funding, you have to think about marketing, and the list goes on and on and on. But obviously, you can't focus on all of those things at the same time. So, um, how, to, how do you prioritize and how do you, where do you focus first? I think it changes, right? Uh, look, there's a, there's a point in time where you're just going to have to ditch everything and go out and raise money. Right, so, so I, I, I think um, it takes a bit of discipline as a founder CEO to know what is most important at that particular point in time, and then you know go for it 100%. So I, I don't think there's a straight answer to that. Um, um, I can tell you the things that people often forget, 
right? Fair enough, then do that. Um, and, you know, and by the way, with other people actually, including myself, kind of, I have to remind myself that it's, 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 it's recruiting. Um, yeah, from day one, you have to set up your company for recruiting. How do I get the best talent on board? And that doesn't, that's more than just having a great, let's say, technical recruiter on, on board. Uh, but it's like, you know, what conferences do I attend so I can find the best people? How do I start? What, what's the culture at my company so I attract the best talent? And so that just has to be like a red line that runs through your company from day one till forever, essentially. Mm. Google does a great job at that, right? Mm. Now, how important is technology? I mean, we're all in the, in the tech business, and you know, tech is the, the overarching topic. Um, but then again, it, people always say um, you can't. If, if you if you see if you feel the technology, if you see it, then it's not a good product because it's too technology driven. It's not focused on the customer. Um, but it is important, right? Yeah. Um, it's kind of sometimes a bit of my pet peeve, actually, actually frustration because sometimes. You see two companies competing with each other. One clearly has a better technology than the other, and then yet, you know, they don't necessarily win. I think yeah, the example of AMD and Intel back in the day is a, is a is a great one. Intel just happened to have better marketing and branding, and uh, and so it's kind of sad actually. I, in, in my world, I wish that the better product and the product technology kind of like will take the market, but it, it has proven not not to be always the case, and I actually don't have a great answer to that. I guess you have to pay attention to your marketing and branding and consumer acquisition, uh, uh, so that, you know, yeah, even, yeah, even the best technology doesn't always make it. Mm. Now, how much should you listen to your customer? I mean, Henry Ford famously said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, we all know that uh, Apple, for instance, uh, while they do uh, ask their customers, they don't pay that much attention, but they stick to their vision and push their product the way they see fit. Um, but that's, that's obviously not, that, that can't work for every company. So how do you know when to listen to your customer? Yeah, I, w I would, again, this is a balance, right? Not everybody, very, very few people are Steve Jobs, even if they like to think that they, they are Steve Jobs and they can tell what people need, or like Henry Ford. Um, um, I think it's super important to listen to your uh, first and heavy users, uh, maybe a little bit less to the other ones, because yeah, there's always going to be complaints and you need to try to like set it aside. But, but listen very carefully to your early users, uh, make them part of your organization, right? This is why community management has become so important, right? Celebrate them. Uh, and, 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 and get them involved. So um, I'd say it, it's, it's pretty important. Now when you build your first product and get it out there, just get it out. Rather, because rather than running in circles and keep asking and showing mockups and stuff like that, just get something out and then have your uh, first users help you find you. Um, how important is, is um, the team. I mean, VCs always say they look for the, the best team. Founders always uh, emphasize how important the team is. But how do you how do you do that? How do you find the right people? How do you go out and uh, where do you look? And I mean, you've you've uh, been involved with all your companies in very yep. early stages, yep. so you know quite a little bit, uh, quite a bit about that. Yeah. So so first of all, like to me, it starts with have multiple co-founders, right? And then have you know obviously very, very smart people. Uh, it's kind of like two things. Um, let's say one, um, uh, have people from different walks of life, i.e. with very different skill sets and maybe mentalities. So um, if, um, if I look at the Forces and co-founders, from a business point of view, we could not be more different. Uh, we, you know, I wouldn't say that we had arguments. We would have had screaming fights in the early days about you know how things, how we believe things should have been done. Uh, and and if you kind of take a step back, that was always to the uh, to the better or the improvement of, of the company. So that's part one. At the same time, though, I think you kind of need to separate personal from business, right? And so. Um, as much fights as we had and disagreements on how Shazam should be run or evolved, 
Um, we always had the deepest respect and integrity for each other. We were the best friends. And so the best teams, you know, are, as I said, very different from a company point of view, but from a kind of a personal integrity angle, they, they are very similar. Mm -hmm. But then you left Shazam, and um, the <coughs> question behind this is, is there a certain point where, um, where founders need to think about, can I still, you know, add value to the company, or should I leave it, leave the decisions to people who, you know, are more technically inclined more on the marketing side, no, no matter how to run a growing business. Yeah, I mean, look. Um, again, they're kind of the exception, exceptional founders who can do all of that for decades. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, Larry Page. You know, but the, there's, you know, there's, there's not that many of them. So um, I will openly admit that. Um, you know, I, I enjoy and I think I'm good at starting companies. I'm not sure if I could ever be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, right? And so if you can be honest with yourself and admit that, you know, there's a better person to bring into the fold and, you know, run the organization from where you have brought it, that's, that's probably ideal. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, your VCs will tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, are there any questions in the audience? Come on, there's one. Of course, Philly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know there's a big thing about building MVPs. Everybody's like, build an MVP before you, you know, um, go large and everything. But sometimes I feel that MVPs are not most lovable product, but really just hardly there. Would you recommend building MVPs all the time, or would you say it's better to take some more time and more effort before showing it to customers and then maybe not catching their attention or? So if you, so I think everybody can hear the question, right? I think we're on the microphone. So, um, if you have nothing, right, you have, you have to get something out, right? And Google will say, you know, launch soon, launch often. And that's the same as like, build an MVP and get it out. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and um, I agree with that. Um, once you have your product in market, um, I, I don't think it's always necessarily kind of to, to make those tweaks instantly and, and, and test it. You can actually, as we talked about your you know, early users, your power users, you can just start with them first before you go through the cycles of engineering and see how they react to it. In many cases, you know, they will have already told you what they want, so you're kind of already building towards them anyway. So um, I'm not sure that there was a direct answer. I, I'm a, the short of it is I'm a believer in it. It doesn't always mean that you kind of have to kind of like stamp it out and, and, and get it going. Uh, the bigger the company it is, the, high, the more difficult it becomes, right? Because you know, if you think about Facebook, one tiny tweak to the newsfeed just upsets the entire world, right? And so like, right, so, so they're clearly, yeah, <laughs> it doesn't always work. Are there any more questions? Yeah, that's one. Um, I'm Leslie from Smooth, the service management platform. Uh, what I would be interested in is to hear, so now you have this great product, you, you uh, to take the first steps, and how did you tackle, let's say, IP? How did you protect your idea, your software? Uh, did you pay to the, at which stage? Uh, were there some copycats, and how did you deal with it, internally and externally? Yeah, so the question was, how do you manage intellectual property, right? Um, well, first of all, like, as sad as it is, if you have anything which is patentable, you, you gotta patent it. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna go out and enforce it, right? Uh, but it's maybe probably more defensive than anything else. And if you ever wanna be acquired and you don't have any reasonable patent portfolio behind your product, it's, it's, it's gonna take away from your acquisition. Um, so, so that's something kind of, it's just not optional, you gotta do it. Having said that, practically speaking, um, well, you know, I guess, what do they always say? Copying is the best form of flattery, right? And so, um, if you have a truly good product, you will get copied, right? Uh, most likely, your IP will get infringed on, right? So, the question you have to ask yourself, do I then, you know, use the legal ways to build my company and market, or just do I fight it out in the market itself? I hope it's the latter. But obviously, like depending on the industry as well, sometimes you have to fight it out in court. So, like I think in the world of technology, where things just move so fast and where patents become a little bit too easy, 
um, I, I would I would prefer to you to see it kind of like true in the market itself and just demonstrate okay. to your users that you're worth it. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. But maybe that you shouldn't focus on. So, from your insights, I'd be very interested to know six months in ID, three months, what should you really be focusing on during those three to six months, in your opinion? Uh, is it just product or is there other elements to it? And then the second question, maybe related to that, would be you're going six months and you're not kind of going the direction that you want to go. Um, should you pivot or not? Should you change from your original idea? Um, your insights into that. So I'm just going to repeat the question because I'm not sure if I understood it fully, okay. completely myself. So it's like, what should you focus on in the first six months, yes. correct? And then at what point should you pivot or not pivot? Okay. okay. Um, look, in your first six months, if, you have a, if you're starting from scratch, I would just focus on two things, product and team. Okay? Um, all the rest is kind of like secondary IP and funding and, you know, because without a product and a team, you're just not going to get anywhere. Um, and so, so, so that's that. Um, pivots, I, I guess that's just <laughs> it's kind of like a sexy word these days for kind of refocus. Um, I, look, once you build your product and it's out there, you'll, you should quickly find out whether it, it, it works or not. Um, yeah, does it market itself? Do people come back the next day? Do they use it multiple times in a day, right? It's kind of an addictive format, so to speak. If it doesn't have any of those elements to it, then you may want to think about changing or pivoting based on what you learn from your early users. Uh, but don't pivot too quickly, easy. Too, don't pivot too quickly, right? Because again, there's this element of conviction and, 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 and companies go through the lows and the lows are like your product doesn't get used for a while. But the Shazam story, if you were to look at a graph well, between 2000 and today, I mean like the first five years look like as if it were flatlining and the same for Airbnb. Uh, but clearly, you know, we looked at certain metrics and felt that they were there that we could improve upon uh, enough for us not to kind of ditch the idea and do something different. Um, but some tenacity is, is needed too. Okay, um, I think Philip, you will be around for a couple of more minutes. So if you have any more questions, just you know, go and like this guy. You might actually know a thing or two. Um, otherwise. Um, thank you for being here, thank you for listening to us, uh, have a great time for the rest of the day, and uh, yeah, well, enjoy yourself. Thank you.